ICT and high tech, they're thinking about Bill Gates, Steve Jobs. But here in Africa, we have some amazing brains of our own. Today, we're going to meet one of them, Patrick Nsenga Buchana, who is the CEO of AC Group. And together with his partners, they have broken into the transportation system of Kigali City and introduced ICT that has done some amazing things for the city. So come along on this journey with me. Let's go meet him and learn from him. Uh, I'd like to welcome Patrick to this ride along with me. And uh, Patrick, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> and today um, I wanted to talk to him because um, I think he has done some amazing things with um, in the ICT and high tech that, um, for the company he has started. And so I just wanted to start from the beginning, Patrick. Um, I want to start from um, school. Like, yeah. were you always into ICT and high tech? Was that your thing in like your lower secondary or higher secondary? Well, uh, it, it wasn't really my thing. I, I wanted to be a footballer when I was much younger. <laughs> At some point, that didn't seem like it was going to be possible. Um, then I decided to to think about something else, and, and I felt like doing law. Mm. Unfortunately, I didn't get um, the exact marks for law to be on scholarship. So I decided to try something else, and then ended up doing electronics and telecom. That was at Kigali Institute, Institute of Science, Science and Technology. Technology. Yes. Okay, uh, and it's a four-year course, right? Yes, it's a four-year yeah. course. So you go into uh, KIST to do yeah. your engineering, yeah. and how long were you there? I was there for two years. Um, after two years, I felt like it wasn't exactly for me, so um, and I could do a bit of self-learning on my own. So then decided to do to branch off and do just that. Um, it was electronics and telecom, and decided to go in for. Uh, something that I liked, which was more uh, around software and um, smart city solutions and the likes. And which avenues, like, how are you learning? When you say self-learning, did you go in some online courses? Like, what did you do? I uh, did some online courses, uh, some on Linda, um, others on uh, Coursera and uh, EDX quite a number of interesting um, software programs so to really learn like what that's what like software engineering software design um, software development programming uh, and, and, and the likes and architecture and kind of designing uh, projects and what does it take to actually have a software or a mobile application and the likes so I did a bit of that mm. um, and then started off with with a project that I felt like was uh, was needed, uh, which was the food delivery. I'm doing it with, with a friend of mine. Mm. Unfortunately, it wasn't as successful uh, as we thought it would be. This was 2000 what? It was about 2013. Okay. Um, then branched off to do something else, which was a citizen um, complaints application um, for the Ministry of Local Government. And then Microsoft for Africa partnered with us. And it, uh, after some time as well, it also didn't work out exactly the way we thought, we thought it would, so yeah. which led me to my third try, which was um, the company that I run at the moment. So AC Group, which you are the CEO, yeah. um, it deals right now with a lot of things, but one of its major things is tap and go. Yes. So how did the idea come about? Was it you alone or was it a group of people? Like, How did you come up with the idea? So it was um, a group of people. Um, we had all used public transport. We knew the challenges that were in. Personally, I used public transport to go to school, and it wasn't convenient. So at that point, I decided to, you know, what, what, what can we do? And we, we looked at, um, at the sector. We approached the bus companies. But when we talked to them, they said everything else should be put on hold before you um, help us solve the, the, the challenge of revenue leakage, which I think is a problem um, that companies... That was their biggest problem. That was their biggest problem. And it's revenue not just a problem leakage. here, 
it's a problem across the continent when you get to, to, to meet all these other Revenue companies. leakage means their drivers and conductors kind of take a bit of money. Yes. That exactly. They don't own up to all the money they're receiving. Yes. Yeah. Uh, a bit is actually an understatement. A we lot a of the yeah. money. <laughs> so uh, then we decided to say, you know, the first innovation we have to think about will uh, be one helping them to recover their revenue. Um, and then we actually found out that if we help them recover their revenue, that means they have more income to be able to invest more in the business and buy more buses. So the delays and the inconveniences that we were all talking about would actually be solved by that. Yeah. Um, it would also help them collect data that helps them make decisions. If you, from our system, you can know how many people use a particular route, what times are the busiest, so you know how many buses to deploy in particular routes at what times. So it helps um, in, in their operations day to day. It helps recover their revenue. Almost 25% uh, of um, their revenue was, was, was recovered. Mm -hmm. um, it, helped, it gave them data that helped um, to, to, to help them make informed decisions. Not just them, but also the government. And now planning for public transport for the next five to 10 years is very easy because you have data that you can base on. And, and, and that's some, those are some of the benefits that the system has brought to the different stakeholders. So now you have this problem, you finally found something you can solve, you have a team, you're working on something, how do you move forward? Like what did you, how did you first of all get funding to, to design this software or like how did you come up with the idea and how did you facilitate it in a way? Well, uh, the, the the funding was, was a big challenge. The kind of project that we're doing, especially the tap and go, was very capital intensive. Mm -hmm. It required so much in terms of investment and for us to actually cover the market um, to a sizable portion whereby the, you know you have a firm portion of the market and you're comfortable as a business, we had to move very fast. And the revenues that we needed to, to make also needed quite a number of devices to be invested in. And at this point, we started looking for options. Yeah. Um, we then approached uh, one of the business development funds here to, for us to be able to get a loan. Which we fund wanted, is that? Um, it's called uh, Business Development Fund. Okay. It's uh, BDF. Here and in Kigali. Here in Kigali. Yeah. yeah. And we wanted so much, they gave us almost a tenth of what we actually wanted. What was but, your original request? Um, 600 a million running francs and we only got uh, about a hundred thousand dollars wow so that's like less that's like a fraction of what you yes. did so how did you move forward with that we just uh, kept on pushing we said with this hundred let's let's find a way of doing what we can do and try to push on um, we never knew how how it would turn out uh, four months six months from then but we knew one thing was for sure whatever we have now let's try to make as much use of it as possible. Yeah. And then we'll keep on trying uh, the different options. Yeah. And um, we started, we started with one bus company. Um, they trusted us, we told them, look, you have nothing to lose. Yeah. We're going to try something. If it increases your revenue, you give us a portion of that. Okay. Just give us a platform to, to run this. To run this. And we, they did, we, we tried it and finally- When you say tried it, you mean the the we devices you put in the buses? Yes, we install devices in the buses. So the 100,000 was enough to only deal with one bus company? Oh, no, no. Just a portion of one Just bus company. Just a portion? Yeah, like so particular route. You, st you say, we're picking this route and then we're going to do, we're going to try it out. Yeah. And then you, you try it out that route and you ask them, how much do you used to earn before? How much are you earning now? What does it look like? And all these um, came to life and they, they could see the increment in revenue, they could see the improvement in operations, yeah. they could see the reduction in accidents because with our device, mm -hmm. it also has GPS and it monitors speed and, and some of those these parameters. From that day on, then our biggest problem now was raising money. To increase your supply? Yes. But one thing we, we also did was we, we spent a lot of time trying to define what kind of solution would fit the market that we were serving. What do you mean by that? Mm, we mean we spent so much time in the pilot, which we called first phase, mm. and this pilot was to understand what exactly do these people need, because you could solve their revenue um, leakage problems, 
but there's so many other problems that we that we also needed to solve while doing you know killing two birds with one stone yeah so that we don't have to make more investment in the future and we also don't have to 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 have so many needs coming up yet they could have been dealt with it moved and we could see and learn and tweak our system according to what some of the different things that we were learning and as we went along it it was exciting it was a steep learning curve but good for the team yeah you had the prototypes made for you so we designed the prototype and then we had them manufactured um because of course cost of manufacturing here especially is without without the economies of scale we mm. were going to be a bit um tough on the but business. is there the infrastructure here to develop those prototypes are there companies here in in Kigali in Rwanda in particular that can manufacture assembling yes uh, i would confidently say yes manufacturing no. i think we still have we still have okay. a way to so where did you go we went to Turkey and some other components in China and how was it when you did your first pilot run <laughs> with the with the few vehicles you had you see we were never comfortable so we never really had any moment and enjoyed it <laughs> for that for that very moment uh so it was it, it just showed us okay this has worked mm-hmm. now we have to worry about tomorrow where mm-hmm. we need to to show this to the to the different stakeholders and they have to like it mm-hmm. um and then right after that they're going to ask us for devices and we don't have the money yet so there was and never and then how many people were you in the car um about maybe 8 we had shareholders or just no 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 the whole team the whole team uh, the, sh- the shareholders plus support team how many so, shareholders were there at that point uh two only two and yes. then the rest was staff yes the rest was staff and where were you getting the money to pay these other six people from the 100000 uh no actually the 100000 was never used for any um administration or operational expense it all just went it was into all into equipment yeah um we got it from the few savings that we had um here and there your own personal savings yes oh, wow. and then immediately when the business started it was enough to to clear some of these um expenses that we had after a few months we managed to get a next fund after another one of the other banks had seen that actually this business is it's making money is is going to make money and is a future so they invested in us a, um, a significant amount of money which, which we then boosted operations yes i yeah. boosted operations bought more equipment um helped us to stabilize the service yeah. and then finally we then went through um raising of money from um, vcs and and different parties and then we landed on one um japanese technology company which um appreciated uh, the service and here we are now so are they so are focus, they your manufacturers right now no they no, they were just uh, yeah they just investors, investors. So yeah. right now how big is your team? Now we have about um about 58 full-time staff, almost 120 um part-time staff. What do you mean by part-time staff? Um So those are doing um different roles. They they, they, they so they, they they work in shifts, agents, physical agents on the ground, inspectors, supervisors, and some in the different locations that okay. we've we've set up. for selling and buying of tap and go cards and loading and, and likes. Uh, so you said how you did self learning in order to develop this software and all but right now you are running a company with more than uh, 150 <laughs> employees. How do you deal with now the administration administrative part of things? How do you learn to manage human resource and the finances and accounting? We try to get the best um in terms of uh finance and controls and we didn't want to compromise even though we were a startup and we were very short on cash yeah. but we tried to get very good uh people to to take on these roles and and, and of course other roles as well but we were we had a lot of emphasis on experience and my job is now just look at the overview of this whole um reports and in general basically yeah So what um, skills are those that you had to kind of pick up in order to be this overall manager? I did a lot of reading um, yeah. because the company was growing fast but at at some point I realized it was growing really fast, much faster than my reading. And so I decided to then look at some uh, advanced uh, management programs 
did one with Stanford, um, doing another one with Harvard, currently Harvard Business School. Mm-hmm. Um, all of them are at um, how do you manage um, scale, how do you manage innovation um, in this day and era where disruption is, is, is you know, almost everywhere. And you, you sleep one night and tomorrow someone has a better technology than you. that is cheaper and more convenient and so you always have to be on your toes um, which, which is good for the business and um, but leave, leave that alone you know the company is growing and growing very fast and mm. you have to scale and you have to manage all these things and you can't let them take over um, your core uh, role as the CEO and manager of the business delegating, delegating was one of my uh, challenges actually because you're used to controlling micromanaging, and micromanaging yeah. everything and now it's it's you have some some of the subsidiaries which are miles away five hour flights and if you're going to micromanaging then you're not going to do your job and you're not going to let the other managers do their job yeah it took a bit of learning and understanding and trying and failing and trying again we, we managed to get there now let's talk about a bit about the growth of the company because you started off with a few buses then you got some investment pumped in, some capital pumped in. You're now dealing with other um, bus companies. Um, and uh, we spoke earlier and you said then the government got involved. How did, like, explain that part? As I said, when I talked about the importance of the service, mm-hmm. it was very visible to them that this is the future of transport. Yeah. And every other um, development that you want to do in, in, in area of smart transport and and the likes had to have a foundation which foundation is data that's accurate and this system that we're providing was bringing all this value so they said you know if some people are still using cash and some people are using the card it creates inconsistency in the data that's collected yeah and so the bus companies were also seeing the value because of the increased revenue so they you know said it, it would be better if everyone uses the card and then the bus companies pushed for it and the government had no reason to, to object. They actually wanted it as well. So in that case, they then asked for it to go ahead and of course there was resistance from different stakeholders who had reservations, especially commuters, people who are used to carrying cash in their pockets. Yeah. And now you're telling them you have to use a card. That was a, a trick. They got used to it and then it, it became a mandate. Kigali becomes the first public transport cashless transport system. In East Africa? On the continent. So what are other subsidiaries you have um, apart from Tap and Go? Because that's just a subsidiary of the AC Group. Within Tap and Go, we also have um, three major ones. Mm. Um, so we have Tap and Go Rwanda, we have Tap and Go Cameroon, and then a few other countries that we are also setting up right now. We also ventured into connecting people, um, and that's on Wi-Fi, so 4G Wi-Fi. So we have um, Tap and Go Wi-Fi which is installing um, devices on each of the buses in, in Rwanda and connecting people to Wi-Fi free of charge. We are also looking at expanding this to other public spaces as well as um, other countries in How do companies gain from free Wi-Fi? So on free Wi-Fi there's advertising, there's hosting of applications, there's hosting of content that people are so glad to pay for. Mm. Especially look at um, the situation on the bus. People are in the bus for um, 30 minutes and when you look at Kigali. But when you look at other cities like Nairobi, Kampala, um, Abidjan, you could spend an hour or two in traffic. Mm. At peak hour, it could even go to two and a half. Yeah. And all this time, you're with your phone, pretty much bored. Um, we don't have a generation that's re- used to reading books while <laughs> traveling. So they all want to be on their phones, so all of them want to be connected. Now, if you provide a platform where there is Wi-Fi, they're definitely going to connect. Mm. Now, try to remember the last time you watched TV. Most. I don't, I don't exactly. own a TV. See? <laughs> there's no use for TV. No one watches TV. Um, no, there's YouTube. <laughs> you will ask someone, um, how did you look at this new billboard in town? Mm. No one is going to tell you that they actually looked at it because they were down looking at their phones. Yeah. So billboards are no longer the platform that, you know, where people are looking up to. Yeah. No one is watching TV. 
But guess what? If something is shared on WhatsApp, social media, or yeah. Facebook, or Twitter is the new t- is the new news blast. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So Twitter, you you find so many people know of it. Mm. The sharing is so much. People's phones have actually down on memory because of sharing. This is the platform for advertisers. So you are bringing them to a platform that guarantees them the numbers that are actually can be counted, and you can actually let them know that this. Um, at the end of today, we had 300,000 people that looked at you. There's no TV station, at least in our country, that can guarantee you those numbers. Mm. Is it something that has already been started? Already yes, started? It's, it's already something that already, sta- already started. Oh. Another subsidiary of ours is, is one that has ventured into car hailing services, um, Little Ride, um, which we are going to launch in Rwanda and a few other countries. And it's, it's, I think car hailing is no longer... Um, something that you can say is I mean, it's done in so many cities in the world mm. it's needed and that's why we think um, we, sh- we should invest in it. I think something we overlooked was the fact that you've gone beyond Kigali and now there's, there's uh, you're now in Nairobi, you're starting up in Nairobi and you're wounded. Yeah. How did that come about? Like, Did the cities approach you or you don't went and approach the cities? Yes, we, they, were approach, they approached us. Okay. Um, we've actually had so many city mayors coming to see what has been done with the public transport here wow. um, and have called us to start in their countries. Unfortunately, um, some of them, they don't really have um, the platform for us to start from in, in, in the sense that you find that in, in, in the particular city, there are more of the small cabs, West Africa especially, mm. there's more of the small cabs for public transport than the buses. Mm, yeah. So you find that it's, it's a whole new different model for us. We've been a bit resistant in, in picking the countries where we're going to start from, but every country is important to us. Yeah. And we're still finding models that fit um, some These of different those. different countries. Exactly. One other uh, product which is still under tap and go, but uh, I would also like to, to put, put, uh, shed some light on is more of uh, the transport logistics uh, for international conferences. So we also manage um, transport vehicles for VIPs and delegates in conferences. So we did it for the World Economic Forum. We did it for the African Union, um, where we had over 44 heads of state coming to Rwanda. Mm. We did it for the Transform Africa. And, you know, we manage the fleet. um, And there's a lot of movement from hotels to venue and When you say manage, what do you mean? Yes. How do you monitor them? So we, we, um, it's, it's a platform. Um, that kind of, uh, you can see, you, you have full vision of, of everything that's happening, but also um, different delegates have different packages, mm. and depending on those packages, they give them access to transport. Um, so we, we have our card um, branded with the conference um, details, and then we have our device in the vehicle, which still manages driver behavior, and manages the fleet, and, and, and all this. Okay. Um, do you have, like... A think tank of people who kind of come up with like the new innovation or the direction you're going like how do you like wake up in the morning and you're like today we're going to start doing something where we're going to monitor cars like do you have that think tank of group or like of trusted thinkers around you no we don't everyone is is, is a thinker at AC group so Every, like even the receptionist can come up with an idea and be like boss yes. there's an idea yeah. <laughs> Everyone is part of the team, and then equal um, part of the team. So the moment they see an opportunity, they come to us. Yeah. So we evaluate all opportunities equally, with respect to where they come from, and we always encourage that. We had something called Innovation Night in the past, but yeah. we felt it, it was just too a, much pressure. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, think. So, think. Uh, <laughs> so now we open it up and we let. Um, anyone and everyone come and brainstorm. Um, we also listen to external parties as well. So some of our ideas have been from us in-house. Mm. Some of the others have been actually from external parties. And Do you pay them like a discovery fee or something? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, not yet. Okay. But we hope we can start doing that. <laughs> But we also um, like doing partnerships with other technology companies, and sometimes ideas are actually from them. Yeah. So, okay, which, yeah. like, for example, some companies you've partnered with? Well, quite a lot. 
um, the telcos to start with, um, MTN, uh, Airtel just acquired Tigo um, for top-ups, organizations like the Smart Africa, banks for different services, and yeah. Like on a personal level, how do you deal with the fact that, um, I don't know how it is in, in Rwanda compared to Uganda, but being a young person mm -hmm. and... Because you're quite young, <laughs> and you have to kind of sometimes have to enter some of these boardrooms with these much older people with a lot of experience and kind of gain their confidence. How have you kind of maneuvered around that, or has that ever been a thing? Or for you just entered, you're like, I'm good. <laughs> like, how have you maneuvered around that? Yeah. So I've actually, I, I mean, I never think about it. I never think because of my age, it creates a different, I should maybe do more or try to, I, I just, it's, it's natural for me. Mm. Um, it, I think because I'm in that particular meeting, there's a reason as to why I'm there. Yeah. And um, there's really no need to do, to, 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 to do something extra because I am younger. Yeah. Um, there's something that I want out of the meeting and there's something else that whoever is in the meeting also wants. And that means there's something I can give and there's something they can give. So. I expect that that's the way they see it. Mm. Of course, it's not always the case, but I don't let it get to me. Yeah. Um, I think in, 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 in this day and age where um, young people at 26, 28 years can become billionaires, age is no longer um, a f determinant factor for certain things. You listen to someone and you accord them the respect and understanding that that they, they deserve because they've earned it and, and you see it from, from their face from their or face. from what they're saying or from the contribution that they're putting on the table. So I like to have, have it that way and if someone doesn't do it, then I think it's more of their issue than my issue. Yeah. So I really never dwell on it. <laughs> um, I even forget that. <laughs> but I've, I've, I've gone to so many meetings right now mm -hmm. that it's, it's no longer something I, that, bothers, I, that yeah. bothers me. Yeah. Um, and sometimes people have already maybe heard about me um, before I get into the meeting, so it, it, that, that's even better for it me. Helps. Yeah, it helps. Most times they are surprised by the young face, mm. like, "Oh, is He's the younger one?" Younger than but, I thought. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what about okay. like? Um, do you, do you have mentors who you look up to who kind of like? have really impacted you in terms of how you think or how you've really managed your business? CEO of one of the technology companies that yeah. has been in Rwanda for, for some time now. Okay. Um, and he's, we, we talk a lot, um, almost every other day, or even sometimes, you know, maybe three times a week, mm -hmm. um, sometimes less if we're busy. Mm -hmm. But he gave me um, perspective on many things that I would not have realized, um, even up to now. Um, I talk about something like, have you thought about this other way? And it actually makes sense mm -hmm. um, because it comes with time and with dealing with different cases. So, of course, our company grew much faster than his at the time yeah. because it was different situations, there was different understanding of technology at the time. Yeah. But he's, 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 he's become a personal friend and a mentor and given a lot of guidance. What about like thinkers yeah. or philosophers, but someone who you have either read mm. um, their, their books or their writings or their, and you really look up to and think this person really helped me um, guide my thinking? There's one person that has inspired me along the way, way before I met him and after I met him, mm. and that's Strive Masiwa. So. Strive, um, the chairman of Econet, oh, oh. Um, the Zimbabwean, and Strive is is a Christian, and he's into business, especially in tech. And Strive has he has principles that he's put in business that have actually um, been very very interesting for me. Is that something that's important to you? Your faith in your practice? Yes, so so important. I feel like it's a, it, it, it's a huge component um, and it deals with most of the challenges that we face as a business, mm. um, especially when you look at exporting outside. Okay. The moment you lose those fundamental principles, then I feel like you've lost a big part of 
of business. Mm. And being a young business that has um, grown uh, relatively fast, mm. we are also an example to many other young people that want to make it and grow and expand and become the next Facebooks and the Googles. Mm. So it's very important that the decisions that we make are in line um, with, with who you are, with who we are, what you believe, yeah. what we believe, and not being able to, to compromise at any given time. Okay. So he's been um, it's, it's been great. The second is um, a professor that taught me at Harvard Business School um, called Clay Christensen. Has written a number of books. Um, one of them is Innovator's Dilemma and How Will I Measure My Life. I recommend you read that book. And he also put a lot of principles of innovation in his um, values as a Christian. And it's been nice. Yeah. <laughs> okay. It. As we come to an end, I want to you to give like three pieces of advice for any young innovator out there who is either just starting out or has started and things are not really picking up. So the first is um, you can never wait for everything to be perfect for you to start it. If you wait, you might wait forever. Mm. Sometimes you're lucky and things actually take shape um, and you have everything that you need before you start. But most times, you're not. Just get the minimum viable product that you need to just go out there and start business. Because you actually find out that 80% of what you really need to develop is learned while you while you're practicing, while you're practicing it. it and yeah. you're seeing it and you're talking to clients. The second is at any one point in business, never compromise. The moment you compromise, then you do it again and again. You might not think that you can, but you it, it just happens. And then all of a sudden it eats you up. And the time that you're supposed to use thinking about the business, you're now feeling put guilt, out fires. trying to put out fires and, you know, Treat everyone with respect because everyone is equally valuable. Yeah. And you never know. You never know exactly. who's going to help you get where you need to be. Yes. Yeah. So I get that. It, it just respect everyone. Um, integrity and principles never compromise on those. Whatever the case. If something belongs to you, I always believe that it will definitely Come roll out. to you. Yeah. And the third and final one yeah. is there is so much out there for you to go get. Um, if you're thinking of something, have no limits. Mm. Have no limits whatsoever. Um, always set the bar high. Never sleep and say, I have made it. And I think I'm comfortable. And I think we are the best at this. There's, 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 there's nothing like best, mm. especially in this time. Um, while you're thinking, everyone else is thinking. So the level of comfort is not supposed to be... Um, um, something that you should have. Yeah. And then finally, um, business is great. They <laughs> always say that until you start. <laughs> but it's always worth it. Um, yeah. It's challenging. There's a lot to learn. But at the end of the day, you go to bed and you don't feel tired because you were doing something that was tiring. You feel tired because you felt like you put all your energy to the right use. And you gladly wake up the following day to do the same yeah so that's that's the most exciting thing yeah um, and you get to actually love it and then when you finally do it make it in business please always remember that the most important component of a business is your staff mm. and it will never change it's always been like that it will always be like that your staff are a huge if not the biggest part of the business so always take care of them, always understand and listen to them. They are priority before yourself. Okay. Well, thank you, Patrick. Um, Most welcome. We appreciate you coming to talk to us about your business. And I hope people who are watching this are inspired to go out and pursue what they want to pursue and grow their businesses and develop that idea that you've been sitting on. You don't need, you don't need to have everything. You don't need to have half the money. Just start. And uh, yeah, so thank you so much. You're welcome. Speaking to people such as Patrick, you really learn a lot about what it means to have a vision, to have an idea and to pursue it. 
without even much. Many times we do not pursue the things we want to do because we're limited by resources. But I think today we have learned that you don't need all that. All you need is your idea and a passion to pursue it. When asked at one of the TED Talks for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Bill Gates talked about the importance of collection of data, how data tells a story, data gives guidance to, gov to governments, to organizations, to companies, in order to make informed decisions. And I think that's something that's lacking a lot in our governance and in our countries, lack of data. And so it is important that companies such as AC Group with Patrick Buchana provide that platform where data can be collected to give this data to the government to make informed decisions. I thank you for watching and I hope this session inspired you and I'll see you next time.